Hello, my fellow forgiven sinners. Grace and peace are yours because he is risen. He is risen indeed. I've got a couple of uh, Holy Week uh, considerations for you today um, as we think on these uh, momentous occasions uh, in the history of our humanity, in the history of our world, uh, the days and the events of Holy Week. Today, I just want to uh, paint a couple pictures for you with the various things that went on during that, uh, that Holy Week that we celebrate uh, around the Easter time here. As we consider the amazing things that God has done among us and how often we fail to, to realize what exactly those things are, what exactly they mean for us. To begin, I want to take you back to Palm Sunday when Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey, uh, and it says that too that apparently the the young donkey that Jesus rode on, they also brought uh, his mother along maybe to make sure the donkey was a little calm. Uh, I don't know if you've ever done any kind of animal training or a horseback riding or anything, but generally it's it's quite an effort to teach an, an animal to be able to have somebody on its back and to know how to respond to that. A uh, uh, horse isn't born just being able to do that, and donkeys especially are, are sort of, uh, they've sort of built up a reputation for being rather uh, stubborn, right? <laughs> uh, they don't necessarily just do whatever you want. And yet, uh, when Jesus has his disciples go and get this young donkey that's never been ridden, um, somehow this donkey knows that it's, it's just fine for Jesus to be sitting on him and, and just marches right into Jerusalem. And it's not really the best environment for training a donkey to, to uh, have a rider as well, uh, as there are people screaming all around it, uh, as there are uh, cloaks being thrown this way and that, palm branches uh, being thrown in front of it, right? Uh, a, a lot of times, even today, when you have uh, like a horse-drawn carriage or something, you'll notice that horses will have those blinders on so that they can't see everything else, but they're just focused on what's in front of them. And, and again, the focus there, the point there, is so that the horse doesn't have all those distractions, uh, and instead it can just focus on what the rider is telling it to do. Uh, this was not the case <laughs> for this uh, poor little donkey. But despite that, uh, there seemed to be no problems with Jesus riding that donkey through all of the chaos and insanity. And I think there's a, a fascinating picture for you and I uh, that that donkey was able to march on doing as its, uh, its master, Jesus, had told it to do despite all the craziness and insanity all around it, because that donkey knew who held the reins. That donkey knew who was in charge. As you and I live in a world that maybe seems to be spiraling out of control in a lot of different ways, uh, maybe it's stuff that you're seeing on the news, maybe it's the things going on in your own life, your personal relationships, uh, your personal struggles. A lot of times it can seem like things are just spiraling out of control, like there's not much we can do. But if you and I can learn to realize who is in control, just like that donkey, then we can learn to do like that donkey did, to calmly march forward, doing those things that our God commands us to do, to seek his glory above all things, to love our neighbor as ourselves. We can continue to do those things without uh, being afraid, without just uh, stopping and paralyzing and freezing up. We can march forward without freaking out <laughs> or being terrified because we know who is in control. And the more we realize that, I think the greater confidence that that gives to us to do what is right, uh, even in spite of a world all around us that uh, urges us to do what is wrong. And so we read about Jesus marching into Jerusalem, uh, and we see uh, Jesus throughout Holy Week. He is really butting heads with uh, especially the religious establishment all through Holy Week. Uh, he clears the temple, uh, cleanses it of uh, all the... Um, robbery, frankly, uh, in business that's going on there. Um, and we also see Jesus uh, really pushing back against the religious leaders as well, calling them out for their hypocrisy. Um, this, this continues to be a major theme uh, for, for those who reject Christianity today, is, is the, the hypocrisy uh, in Christianity, uh, that, that people notice that very often Christians are only using their religion as a means to an end. They are uh, trying to use religion in order to gain power over other people, in order to uh, say that they are way better than everybody else or, or, or whatever other thing that they're trying to do. And people recognize that there, there's a problem here. Well, Jesus uh, is, is no fan of such a thing either. And Jesus, who came on Holy Week to Jerusalem to himself be the true religion, 
it's fascinating to see him uh, immediately and so fervently, so strongly push back against the abuse of religion. And there's a, a serious call for you and I as well as we, as we consider our following of Christ um, to take that step back and, and ask ourselves, are, are we misusing this religion that Jesus has given to us? Are we uh, using God as a means to an end? Are we only here to, to uh, use God as a way to accomplish what we want? Or are we instead following our Savior, following him on his footsteps to the cross, uh, doing those things that our God has called us to do? There's a serious question for us all to consider, especially as we think about Holy Week. Um, next we get to Maundy Thursday. Monday Thursday is that, that fascinating uh, day when we uh, celebrate Jesus establishing uh, the Lord's Supper when he says to his disciples, I give you a new, a new command that you are to love one another as I have loved you. And it's quite fascinating that uh, th- that all comes in the context of the celebration of the Passover meal. And the Passover meal, uh, again, just the history behind that is, is really quite um, interesting as we think about what Jesus does then with the Passover by giving us a new meal to celebrate, uh, a new um, ritual to perform, a new memory to attach to this ritual meal. The Jews from the Old Testament, uh, and even uh, Jews today, they celebrate the Passover as a way to remember the Exodus. If you can think back in your Bible history, God had uh, called out to his people who were living in slavery in the land of Egypt. Uh, He sent Moses to them, and he did uh, these great acts and wonders uh, to to be able to bring them out of slavery in Egypt. And then uh, that Passover was kind of that great marker when God was now bringing them out of that life of slavery, and he was beginning them on this grand journey to the promised land of Canaan. Well, Jesus takes that Passover meal, and he makes it something far grander, far greater. He changes it now for the Christian to the Lord's Supper. And you and I are no longer remembering uh, a, a lamb that was sacrificed in order to save our firstborn son. We're no longer remembering uh, when God uh, brought us out of slavery in Egypt. We're not looking forward to moving into the promised land of Canaan. But instead, you and I, as we receive the Lord's Supper, we remember Jesus who gave his body and blood to die for the sins of the entire world. He made himself the new Passover lamb who takes away the sins of the entire world, not just to save the firstborn, but to save all people. We remember that that because Jesus gave his body and blood for us, that as we eat and drink this thing, we proclaim what Jesus has done, that he has saved us not from slavery to some foreign nation, but instead he has saved us from slavery to sin, to death, to fear. And now he has begun, you and I, on this grand journey, not to move into some land in the Middle East, (laughs) but instead to bring us to the promised land of heaven. And that's that grand journey that we now get to share as we celebrate the Lord's Supper together, what Jesus instituted with his disciples on that Monday Thursday. And it was shortly after Jesus and his disciples ate and drank as he pointed out to them the dark things that were about to happen, as he pointed out to his disciples that they were all about to betray him. Uh, or at least all all about to abandon him, and uh, one of them in particular would betray him, that Peter himself would deny Jesus three times, that Jesus was then arrested after praying in Gethsemane. He was tortured. He was finally put to death on that cross. And I find it fascinating that we call that Good Friday because it leads you and I to need to pause and think about what the word good means. Good Friday is not uh, good in the sense that we in our culture typically use that word. Usually when you and I talk about something good, uh, maybe we're talking about like a a delicious food, right, that delights our senses, or maybe we're talking about a a good song, right, that makes us feel good. Maybe it's a uh, a good show or a good experience, a good hobby, a good uh, uh, bit of entertainment, right, that that makes us feel uh, warm and fuzzy, gets that dopamine kicking and things like that. Good Friday is not good in those ways. Good Friday is rather sad as we think about Jesus' passion. Good Friday is is slow. It uh, it's something that you almost don't want to don't want to look at. (laughs) It's brutal. 
if you've ever seen, uh, for example, the the Passion of the Christ, that movie, uh, it's it's a brutal, brutal thing. Uh, that brutal, brutal the the ways that humanity treats itself, right? Um, and especially brutal the ways that we have treated our God. And yet, um, despite the the slowness, despite the uh, ugliness, this Friday is especially good. Because it is here that we see what real love looks like. It is love that has, has transformed humanity. If you, if you, again, look back at the ancient world and consider how the ancient world considered uh, morality that you and I just take for granted today, right? Things like uh, human rights, things like the dignity of, of all humanity, things like the, the sanctity of life, things like uh, even the small and the weak deserve uh, a say, deserve uh, uh, life, deserve the deserve the pursuit of happiness, all these kinds of things that are even uh, codified in our in our legal system and things like that, right? We, we, we have these basic understandings of, of what is good. But a lot of that morality comes from what this man, Jesus Christ, taught, and specifically from what this man, Jesus Christ, did. Because Jesus, though he was God, though he had all the power in the world, he chose to die for you and I who did not deserve it. He chose to show us love, not in the um, rather selfish way that you and I often practice love in our daily lives, right? Uh, uh, I'm going to be nice to you as long as you're nice to me, but if you get, if you get on my bad side, boy, I'm going to take you down, right? Uh, Jesus instead showed this love for his enemies. As he's crucified, he, he prays that his father would forgive the people who are doing these horrible things to him. Jesus shows us, shows us what real love looks like, and this is the, the love that Jesus encourages us on Monday, Thursday to, to show that same kind of love to one another. It's not a love where I just try to get what I can out of you, and, uh, and uh, once you're no longer of use to me, once I no longer enjoy being in your company, now I'm done with you, now I'm moving on to something funner. Um, instead, Jesus has this unstoppable commitment to your good, no matter how deep a cost it's going to be to him. And you and I will abuse that grace of God. We will take it for granted. We will treat it like it's it's nothing, like it doesn't really matter, like we've got more important things to focus on in life. And yet Jesus still marched forward and showed us that love. And that's the kind of love that God encourages you and I to now share with one another. And that, that kind of love has absolutely transformed the world. And that brings us then, uh, after Jesus has died, to our Easter celebration. Jesus died for us. He laid down his life. And then by his power, he took that life back up again. He was not defeated by sin. Not defeated by death. And instead, he has brought life to all humanity. To the entire world, to all of creation. And it's fascinating, again, going back to what we said before at the beginning of this little video here, that very often we don't recognize exactly what Jesus has done. Uh, it's, it's fascinating uh, in the Gospels um, that as Jesus is appearing to the various people and, and showing that he's absolutely alive again, as he's eating in front of them, all these kinds of things, that they, as they are able to touch him and, and see the wounds right there, that he's given them all these proofs. But again and again, the people just do not realize what is going on even though it's right in front of them. It's fascinating in particular, uh, John's account, um, where you have Mary Magdalene, and uh, she sees angels in front of her who are uh, <laughs> you know, explaining what's going on, but she just she doesn't, she doesn't get it. She doesn't see this magnificent thing right in front of her. And then Jesus himself is there and, and talking to her, and, and she just thinks he's, he's some gardener, right? He, he thinks, she thinks that everything is just normal, you know, nothing special, nothing uh, amazing has happened here at all, right? And then, to, and then finally, Jesus reveals it to her, right? He says, Mary, and, and she realizes, Jesus, it's you. And I think, I think you and I often, with our Christianity, with this religion that Jesus came to be, we often don't realize what it is that is right in front of us. We don't realize what God is doing right here and right now. We don't realize the grand adventure that God has called us on uh, to, to follow him through this, this dark uh, world. We don't realize the the amazing journey that we have been brought into, set free from slavery to sin. We don't have, we don't have to be enslaved like the rest of humanity to our, to our sin, to our passions, to, to death, to, it, to fear of it. We're instead set free to, to be like Jesus in all that we say, all that we do, all that we think. 
And we so often don't, don't realize that. Well, my dear friends, I, I pray that uh, this holy week, that Jesus would quietly say your name, and that you might have your eyes opened to see your risen Savior. That he died for you. That he died to take away your sins. That he died to give you that unshakable confidence that that donkey was able to have as, as it realized that Jesus had the reins in its life. That you might realize that Jesus came to be that new Passover lamb who has died to take away your sin, to free you from that fear of death, to free you from slavery, and to usher you on this grand journey to everlasting life. That you might be transformed as you see real love that was shown on Good Friday. And you might understand all that that means. That you might realize that the risen Savior is your Savior. Happy Easter. He's risen. He's risen indeed. Hallelujah. And I say, I say, I say, can't be that easy. And he said, he said.